This is a, a phenomenal time to be a curious uh, person. That People talk about, you know, life, family, balance. I had none. I mean, I literally remember dating some girl. This is truth. Um, and it was like we, we'd been dating a couple years. And like, it's Mark, you're so into your work. I mean, I want to pick a fence. I want a house. I want kids. You know, I mean, you, it's me or your job. And I was like, or me and your, me or your company. And I was like, what's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, if you don't know me well enough by now, after <laughs> dating two years, to know that I'm driven on this, I mean, there was no balance. I came across the fact, um, so this is 1994, nobody has heard of the internet, very, very few people, and I came across the fact that the web, World Wide Web, was growing at something like 2,300% a year. This is in 1994, and anything growing that fast is, even if its baseline usage today is tiny, it's growing so fast, it's gonna be big. And so I looked at that and I was like, there's got to be, a, I should come up with a business idea and that get, you know, on the internet and then let the internet go around this and we can keep working on it. And so I made a list of products that I might sell online and I started force ranking them. And I picked books because books is super unusual in one respect, which is that there are more book items in the book category than there are items in any other category. There are three million different books active and in print around the world at any given time. So my, my the founding idea of Amazon was to build universal selection of books. The biggest bookstores only had 150,000 titles. And so that's what I did. And, and, and I, you know, I hired a small team, and we built, we built the software, I moved to Seattle. I mean, you told your parents you were going to quit D.E. Shaw, where you're successful, making presumably a fair amount of money. Yeah. And you told your wife, Mackenzie, that you're yeah. going to move across the country. What did they all say? They were immediately and reflexively supportive right after they asked the question, what's the internet? Any decision can be di 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 divided into what do I need to do versus how and when do I need to do it. For the what, that is intuition. And by intuition, I use the word energy. And the way to answer any question for yourself personally that you don't immediately know the answer to is to ask this question. Does it energize and expand my life or does it shrink it? If it energizes and expands your life, the answer is, hell yes. You should absolutely do it. That is what you should do. If the decision shrinks you or it deflates you, then the answer is hell no, you should not do it. This is an incredible tool to use in deal making, by the way, because uh, you know I'm in the middle of negotiating a, a massive media deal at the moment, and it's something I've always wanted to do. Yeah. And um, when you're negotiating for something you really want, whether it's somebody that you're dating, or you know it's a salary, or whatever, it may, in my case, it's a massive media deal. Um, you can get really ego driven, right? right? And you can start to get very attached to the deal or to the person or yeah. to the whatever. But you have to stop and ask yourself, is this deal or this person actually expanding right. and energizing mm. me? Or, or are there aspects of it that deplete and shrink me? And if there's any aspect of it that depletes and shrinks, you either have to change that aspect of the deal or the relationship structure, or you have to say no, period. Right. If you decide that, yeah, it energizes me and I really want to do it, then that's what you want. Next, you've got to think about the outcome, which is how and when you make it happen. What motivations do people need to harness to try to make change, as opposed to just reading about change? Um, and that's not supposed to be an easy question. I don't yeah. think like, oh, it's, it's this. Well, um, like I said, I think um, if, if, you, if, if you study engineering and, and you figure out how to design new things, um, then um, it's relatively easy to start a company. Um, you just need to get a few like-minded people um, with you and, and then focus on creating a prototype, a compelling prototype as soon as possible. Um, and then, the, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a strong venture uh, capital industry in this, in this country that will give you funding to take things to the next level. Um, and that, that's all there is to it. Um, and you, you might, if, you know, try it a few times, you might, may or may not succeed. But um, 
I think sometimes people fear, fear starting a company too much. Um, you know, they have to say, really, what's the worst that could, could go wrong? You're not going to starve to death. You're not, not going to die of exposure. Um, what's the worst that could go wrong? In a world that's changing so quickly, the biggest risk you can take is not taking any risk. And I, I really think that that's true, right? I mean, a lot of people, I think, think that, um, you know, whenever it comes to, uh, whenever you get yourself into a position where you have to make some, some big shift in, in direction or do something, um, you know, there are always, people are going to point to the, the downside risks of that decision. And locally, they're maybe right, right? I mean, it, it, for any given decision that you're going to make, there's upside and downside. But in aggregate, if you are stagnant and you don't make those changes, then, um, then I think you're guaranteed to fail, right? And, and not, not catch up. So to some degree, I think it's really right that over time, the biggest risk that you can take is to not take any risks. It's an incredible time to be a learner. I remember when I was young, and I had the World Book, which is one of Warren's products, yeah. uh, and it was very good. But you know, I always felt like, God, I, I, I want to get into this in more depth. I want to understand it better. Today, the videos that are online and the yeah. courses that you can buy with the very best professors, it's phenomenal. You know, take a subject like weather or climate change. Yeah, or what's going on in economics, what's known, what's not known. Now with the foundation, a lot of what I need to learn is about biology, making vaccines and uh, what's going on with these, these various diseases. This is a, a phenomenal time to be a curious uh, person. The information that's out there, you know, I have a, my, my biggest problem is that I stay up too late because I'm reading and then I'm a little bit tired the next day. Biggest lesson I learned was, thank goodness I learned it pretty early on, which is, and I think a lot of business owners make this mistake, um, which is uh, because I was the boss, you know, in my own mind. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought I had to know all the answers, and if I didn't, I thought I had to pretend that I did, and uh, that's stupid. Um, and what I learned is that just because I may have the the top position in the hierarchy, I, I I'm not expected to know everything. And if I pretend to know everything, it diminishes the value of all the great ideas and the great intelligence around me. And when, when things got difficult, I would never admit it, right? I would just put on a brave face and show up every day. And, um, and the, the, the biggest lesson I learned was to say, I don't know, I don't understand, or I need help um, at, at any level about any subject. Yeah. And amazingly, I was always surrounded by people who wanted to help or who knew answers, but they never offered to help or offer the answers because they didn't think I needed it because I kept pretending that I knew it all. Right. Not to mention the fact that nobody likes to know it all. Um, so that was huge for me. And, and when I was willing to ask for help and accept it when it was offered and, and sort of accept the humility of the fact that other people know a lot more about a lot of things than I know. Uh -huh. I know one thing, you know, and they know lots of things. Um, uh, that's when things really started to move because we were now a team. Like we were actually working together. I have paid attention to my life because I understand that my life, just like your life, is always speaking to you. Where you are, in the language, with the people, with the circumstances and experiences that you can understand and interpret if you are willing to see that always life, God, is speaking to you. Now, it took me a while to actually really get this and to understand it, but once I did, I started paying attention to everything. And one of the reasons why I can now accept the fact that I can offer my gatherings of information and wisdom and call myself a spiritual teacher is that every single person who ever came on my show, and I hear there's like 37,000 guests I've talked to, a lot of them came from dysfunction and a lot of them wouldn't appear to be teachers, but every one of them had something to say that was meaningful and valuable and that I could use to grow myself into the best of myself, which is what all of our jobs are. Your number one job is to become more of yourself and to grow yourself into the best of yourself. I listen to my gut, it's not scientific. I've learned over time, and I think every entrepreneur should 
trust their um, feelings because I've learned every time I don't listen to my gut, I lose money. Every time I say to myself, no, you're wrong with that, I second guess myself, I lose money. You have to listen. Successful entrepreneurs have a spider sense. I really believe that. They know what's right. They know what's wrong. They have to listen to themselves. And it doesn't always work out, but the minute you second guess yourself, you're screwed. You really are. You, you are no longer a leader. People that follow you into dark places have to trust you, and you have to trust yourself. I had never taken a business class. I'd never worked in fashion or retail. And I had $5,000 in savings. I just moved out of my mother's house. I was 27 years old, and I was probably dating a loser at the time. So, there you have it. <laughs> there I was. And I, you know, wanted to wear these pants. I didn't know where to go, so I decided, I've got to get this made. I went on the internet. And I started looking up hosiery mills. And I went to a website called thomasregistry.com, which lists all manufacturers in the United States. Now it's called thomas.net. But they listed it for me, and lucky for me, most of the hosiery manufacturers are in North Carolina. Well, I was in Atlanta, Georgia at the time. So I started picking up the phone and calling all these manufacturers and introducing myself over the phone. And I, I just, I A, couldn't get the right person on the phone. People kept transferring me around. I mean, I imagine on the other end of the line them saying, you know, here, there's a girl on the line, so she's going to transform her own butt. Like, wh who, which department am I supposed to send her to? <laughs> Everyone kept either hanging up on me saying, no thanks, it's not a good idea. So I believed in my own idea enough, though, that I realized, okay, I want to patent this. I may be having some difficulty right now getting someone to help me make the idea, but I want to protect it. So I went and looked up on the internet Martindale Hubble, which is a website that lists attorneys, and they will tell you the ranking and you know sort of the rating next to them. I started looking for a female patent attorney in the state of Georgia, and I couldn't find one. So I called the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, and I introduced myself, said I'm looking for a female patent attorney, and they told me that there actually was not a female patent attorney in the state of Georgia at the time. So I said, okay, I got it. I'm going to go describe this to a man and we'll see what happens. And I went on the website. I picked three different law firms. I cold called each law firm. I put on my nicest suit from selling fax machines that I had. I had my lucky red backpack that was with me the entire journey of Spanx. And I went and met with them. Well, they all quoted me between three and $5,000 to patent it. And I had $5,000 set aside in my savings to do this. So I decided to patent it myself. Well, the attorney that ended up helping me at the very end of this process, he admitted to me that when I came to him with the idea that he thought my idea was so bad when I met with him, that he actually thought I had been sent by Candid Camera. <laughs> which completely makes perfect sense because I was, as I was sitting in the room explaining it to him, he kept looking around the room and he later said to me, <laughs> he said, Sarah, I really have to tell you, I either thought you were sent by Candid Camera or that I was being pranked by some of my guy friends because you, know, you whipped out the pantyhose, you're showing me the, the crotch and where you cut these and how you're gonna change the world. And he's like, I wasn't used to that. 